Welcome, everyone. Um, I'll try to be brief and introduce and leave much to the panel, and just give some background of introduction. As you know, on February 17th of this year, the Parliament of Kosovo declared its independence from Serbia. In doing so, the Parliament explicitly invoked the 2007 suggestion of so-called supervised independence for the region, coming from a um, special UN envoy. Following this declaration, the United States and several European states have officially recognized the independence of Kosovo. Other countries have rejected it. Serbia did not accept it. And Russia, as you know, has been extremely crit uh, critical of this. These developments raise a lot of issues. Some of those issues are obviously political, concern issues of international stability, state sovereignty, protection of human rights, minority interests. As you all know, the last time Kosovo declared independence in 1990, that was one of the events leading to um, the war, uh, eventual intervention of NATO, and the establishment of a um, UN administration in Kosovo. Now, as we know, new violence has ensued in Kosovo. The Serbian government, I understand, has effectively uh, collapsed over the question how to deal with these developments and the, quest the question for closer ties with the European Union. So this is, again, eminently relevant politically. But of course, we're a university, so we don't just look at political aspects, we also look at international law aspects. And in the words of Alan Buchanan, existing international law regarding secession is seriously defective. We'll learn more about that in a moment. But international law is not very clear on when secession is legal, when it's illegal. And this is vital, if not only for Kosovo, then also for the question of to what extent this is however it turns out, of precedential value to other independent movements in the world. And finally, in recent years, philosophers have looked at the philosophy, philosophical aspects of secession and um, uh, national integrity and sovereignty and conflicts between those aspects of sovereignty, sovereign self-determination versus um, sub-sovereign self-determination, minority rights versus minority rights, a right a remedial right to secede versus a primary right to secede, et etc. et cetera. So we're lucky that today we can look at all those three aspects indeed on a panel because we have an absolute first class panel discussing these questions. And I'll leave the aspects much more to them than to myself. My first, Professor Tibor Varadi, who teaches at Central European University in Budapest and at Emory Law School in Atlanta. He was born in Serbia, studied in Belgrade and Harvard, and has been a law professor for much of his life, but in different countries. From 1992 to 93, for a short time, he was the Minister of Justice for Yugoslavia under the government of Milan Panic. In 1993, he had to leave the country and began teaching in Budapest at Central European University, where he was pro-rector and head of the Legal Studies Department since 1999. He also holds a position at Emory. Professor Varad is a member of the Hague Permanent Court of Arbitration and had, had, and is one of the world experts on private international law and international commercial arbitration. But he's also more recently become more and more involved with issues of international law and indeed of national integrity and secession. He's acted as agent and counsel in 11 cases, I think 11 cases, before the International Court of Justice, including most recently and perhaps more prominent, prominently as um, in defense of Serbia in the genocide case before the International Court of Justice that was decided last year with at least, you can say, a par partial acquittal of Serbia for the Bosnian genocide. And Professor Varadi has written about ethnic problems in Yugoslavia and its successor states. Eleven years ago, in an article entitled Minorities, Majorities, Law and Ethnicity, Reflections of the Yugoslav Case, he discussed the problems of minorities in multi-ethnic Yugoslavia and its successor states, including the discrimination of um, uh, committed by Albanians in Kosovo against Serbians and the subsequent oppression of Albanian Kosovo by the Belgrade government that led to developments in the 1990s and that I'm sure he will mention again in discussing problems today. And our other panelist today is Professor Alan Buchanan, James B. Duke Professor of Philosophy and James B. Duke Professor of Public Policy Studies here at Duke University. Professor Buchanan, who graduated from uh, Columbia in 1970, has a PhD from the UNC and has taught at various schools before fortunately coming to Duke in 2002, specializes on a variety of fields, including um, bioethics, 
but also the philosophy of international law, and more specifically, indeed, philosophy of secession. So he wrote a book that has been a standard in the discussion in 1991 called Secession, the Morality of Political Divorce. And a more recent book, Justice, Legitimacy, and Self-Determination, Moral Foundation for International Law of 2004, carries the argument fur further in one chapter dedicated to self-determination and secession. In essence, Professor Buchanan argues that international law should recognize a remedial right to secede, but not a general right to, for any self-determined community to secede, and that the international legal order should encourage alternatives to secession and encourage states to take a more flexible stance toward interstate autonomy arrangements. And I hope you will show us today how that would map out on the specific example of Kosovo. So we have a very specific and very topical event that we're looking at at the moment, and we have two experts from somewhat different fields and experiences looking at that, and I won't waste any more time with myself and leave over to my panel. Professor Varady will speak for 15 minutes, Professor Buchanan will speak for about 15 minutes. We'll have, I hope, a, a debate among the two panelists then, and then I'll, I'll open up to questions and answers from the, uh, from the room. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. It is not the first time that I'm speaking somewhere about, not even the first time that I'm speaking in Duke, about problems uh, which came from the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia. I was hoping, I started hoping a couple of years ago that I will be speaking about conflicts in the past and tensions in the past. But it seems that it is uh, not the past. It keeps to be topical. It keeps to be the present. Uh, approaching the Kosovo issue, almost all players approach it uh, under the angle of history. And if you go sufficiently back in history, you will find explanation for almost anything and justification for almost anything. Uh, I will try to avoid this, but I would have to go back a little bit, not for centuries but about 20 years back in history, because something very, very important happened about 20 years ago, which I think relevant today, and which explains a little bit what uh, is happening today. This was when Milosevic was rising to power in Serbia, uh, when uh, communism wasn't obviously anymore a possible vehicle for power, and uh, he found nationalism as the right vehicle for power. And uh, nationalism was, of course, uh, when it started in Serbia, it also continued in Croatia, in Bosnia, and in Kosovo as well. And uh, some Kosovo Albanians were then uh, demonstrating and seeking a republic. Now, at that time, uh, Serbia had two autonomous provinces, Kosovo with an uh, Albanian majority, and Vojvodina where uh, there was a Hungarian minority, uh, substantial but not making majority within Vojvodina. And Serbia, with these two provinces, was one of the six republics uh, making Yugoslavia. So the Albanian uh, endeavor was to have not six, but seven republics within Yugoslavia, and Kosovo being one of these republics. This was then, of course, perceived as sacrilege, and uh, uh, Milosevic's response was uh, abolishing autonomy. And he did it for Kosovo and for Symmetry or whatever reason, uh, he did it for the Vojvodina as well. This was a completely different approach from uh, Tito's approach for many years. Tito tried somehow uh, to insist on autonomy in order to bring about some ethnic accommodation. Uh, the Milosevic belief was that autonomy would yield to secession, and therefore, in order to prevent secession, uh, autonomy has to be discontinued. Uh, this yielded, of course, protest, and it probably yielded a unity among Albanians, because quite a few Albanians in Kosovo probably would have been satisfied with autonomy. Of course, it depends what kind, what type of autonomy. But this somehow uh, unified 
uh, the Albanian population of Kosovo, and then this was followed by some legal measures which were clearly discriminatory. As it was mentioned, I wrote an article about uh, some specific measures and examples, and I remember as example, and this may be the closest to our profession here, that at the University of Pristina, uh, two Albanian professors were fired because they left their office at 12 uh, noon, although the working hours were until 3 p.m. So I wonder whether any of us or anyone in the academia could have survived this criterion <laughs> and could have uh, remained. Uh, a state of emergency was uh, introduced. There was also a very interesting act on sale of real estate. Uh, this act was prompted by the fact that more and more Serbs were leaving Kosovo after having sold their house or their property. And this was prompted by actually two reasons. One, it was a fact according to, uh, as far as I know and as far as in independent observers were establishing, uh, sometimes Albanian neighbors were harassing Serbian neighbors and pushing them to, to leave. And also sometimes Albanian neighbors were offering above market prices to Serbian neighbors, again trying to prompt them to leave and to have an ethnically homogeneous Albanian situation. Uh, of course, in the Serbian press, you only read about harassment, um, but the truth of the matter was that it was also this offering relatively high prices. And then an act was introduced according to which no sale of uh, real estate is valid without, if it is between a seller and buyer belonging to different ethnic groups, unless it has a permission from some uh, ministry. Uh, an act almost without precedent. It was an act valid for the whole, for Serbia, but nobody cared elsewhere but on Kosovo, where uh, practically uh, these contracts were not admitted. But nevertheless, uh, people informally did give money and did cede uh, land and property. Uh, all these steps, and of course firing of people from schools, uh, propelled a movement towards a parallel society. And it was really a parallel Albanian society created, and what's quite interesting, it had parallel schools in private apartments, it had parallel medical service, and what is really almost incredible, it had a parallel tax system. People were paying, paying taxes without a state. Now, the point is that if you are pushing a minority to create a parallel society, and this minority is small, then you have a ghetto type situation. If you have, if you are pushing not 10% of the population, but if you are pushing 90% of the population to be a parallel society, then this parallel society becomes the real society. And this is what actually uh, happened. Uh, let me also say that the Albanian population and the Albanian resistance was remarkably uh, peaceful if you don't consider these uh, incidents of harassing neighbors, um, burning haystacks, but still, by and large, it was a peaceful resistance up until uh, the late 90s when it turned violent. And of course, then um, Serbian policemen were killed. And according to the Serbian uh, uh, view, these were terrorists and terrorist groups. According to the Albanian view, of course, these were uh, freedom fighters and liberation army. <coughs> And this led to the 1999 bombing, um, which um, probably prolonged Milosevic's grip on power, because it's very difficult for people not to hate those who are bombing and to have this complicated uh, logic that you should hate those who probably provoke this bombing. 
people are hating those who are bombing. And uh, Milosevic was then, in my judgment, he would have probably, because by the time he lost the war in Bosnia, he lost the war in, in Croatia, uh, he probably wouldn't have, couldn't have survived without the, the Inuito bombing, which, which prolonged his grip on power for somewhat less than two more years. Uh, I, uh, maybe in question and answer, I would like to say something about the NATO bombing, but given the time uh, frame, I will uh, not do this now. Uh, during the uh, uh, NATO bombing, about uh, 800,000 Albanians left Kosovo. Uh, it was clearly under, under pressure. Uh, Milosevic had a poetic explanation. He said that they are uh, fleeing because of the bombing and said birds are fleeing, deers are fleeing. Why shouldn't Albanians also be fleeing? Well, it was much, uh, much larger pressure and it was Serbian pressure on them. <coughs> on the other hand, uh, bombing was killing lots of innocent people and particularly the bombing of the Belgrade television was, I think, an outrage. These 800,000 people uh, landed mostly in Macedonia, and this is, I'm not uh, at home enough in history, but maybe the only uh, exodus of such a dimension uh, which became completely reversed. These people did return, almost without an exception, and this is quite rare. Uh, then we had the negotiations in Rambouillet in uh, France where both the uh, Serbian side and the international side proposed autonomy. Um, what was really the reason of the failure is difficult to know, although everything was tried. Uh, one um, negotiating maneuver which stunned the Serbian politicians was that Madeleine Albright was singing a Serbian lullaby to the Serbian negotiators, uh, which took them unguarded. Um, but there was no, no deal. And finally, um, a Kosovo declaration was reached in the United Nations in June 1999. Now, this declaration is important uh, because this declaration is um, today the key argument of uh, Serbia. Because this declaration actually does say uh, that the sovereignty of Serbia uh, should be untouched, and it does say that Kosovo uh, should receive autonomy. Uh, during the debate in the United Nations, some uh, people defending independence of Kosovo uh, pointed out that these key sentences are in the preamble and not in the operative part. But that's a pretty weak argument because in the operative part you have what was created uh, by the resolution and the operative part is that uh, security uh, presence, United Nations security presence will be established. This is what was decided. The preamble uh, takes note of the assumptions uh, on which the resolution is based and uh, the fact that Kosovo is part of Serbia was not created by the resolution. It's an assumption which was noted and noted in quite strong terms. It said reaffirming the commitment of all member states to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and reaffirming the call for substantial autonomy and meaningful self-administration for Kosovo. So this is what the UN resolution says. And this is a pretty strong legal argument for the Serbian side. Uh, the facts of life, of course, are not so much pro-Serbian because this parallel society became the real society and it's really difficult to imagine nowadays Kosovo to be effectively part of, of Serbia. Now, what is also um, interesting and um, that the 
Kosovo Declaration of Independence uh, is uh, trying uh, to somehow counter one of the biggest dangers, and this is that this will be perceived, perceived as a precedent. It's certainly not uh, a sign of a good rule or of good conscience that almost everybody who is pro-independence uh, would say, that, but this shouldn't be a precedent. If one creates a rule, then this rule is, should not be introduced, that this, but this shouldn't be a precedent for, for anybody else. But the Kosovars went so far that even in their Declaration of Independence, they emphasized that I'm citing, observing that Kosovo is a special case arising for Yugoslavia's non-consensual breakup, and it is not a precedent for any other situation. So they really went out of their way to, uh, but of course, whether it's a precedent or not, it doesn't depend on the Kosovo Declaration. So far, as you probably know, they have been, uh, uh, there is already a declaration of independence of Abkhazia, of Ossetia, and we shall see what will this um, uh, yield. Uh, the first country to recognize Kosovo was Afghanistan, which is again a pretty, uh, well, easy um, point for Serbia that the so-called independent Kosovo is recognized by the quote-unquote independent Afghanistan. Uh, the United States was a poor second. Afghanistan was the first, and it's now recognized there were 30 countries. Now, since um, my time is limited, let me just say a few things about the uh, present situation. As I told a few minutes ago to our my colleague Buchanan, um, I believe that what happened was uh, politically unwise. A part of the legal, from the legal side, and the legal side is unclear, uh, to say it, uh, the least, had Kosovo been taken away, I think it should have been taken away from Milosevic. In that case, um, this was then close to an armed conflict, would have been made more sense. But there was this feeling that it would be easier when a more democratic Serbian government comes. But it is so obvious that no democratic government of the world can just chop off and write off a part of the territory. So when this happened, this gave rise to a, a huge outburst of nationalism, a quite predictable one. Uh, and I just cannot imagine that this was uh, not expected because it was so obvious that this is what will come and nothing else could come. It also uh, gave a godsend to the Russian foreign policy. And on May 11th, there will be early elections because the Serbian government collapsed due, uh, due to the Kosovo crisis. And the May 11 elections will be tremendously important because the extreme nationalists, uh, whose leader, uh, Vojislav Šešelj, is before the Hague War Crimes Tribunal uh, on charges of war crimes, he will, it seems, head the list of the Serbian Radical Party. And in this uh, critical uh, situation, the Serbian Radical Party, in my judgment, has about 50% of chance to prevail. Uh, without uh, the foreign policy of the United States, I'm embarrassed to say, and of the European Union, I think this, uh, the Serbian Radical Party would have never had this chance. I think I'll stop at this point and hope that there will be discussion for long. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I've got my, my screen in front of me, so I'll just sit if that's okay. No, no disrespect intended. Um, it's just a feature of the technology. Well, thanks for inviting me here, and I'm, I'm really um, very fortunate to be able to hear Professor Verity, and uh, we had a, a nice chat before the, the session began also. One problem with this panel is that I think there's too much agreement. I agree uh, pretty much with his analysis, so what I'll try to do and I, I suspected that before we 
came here. So I've, I've tried to cover some different things which I think will be uh, uh, complementary to what he's said. In a number of important international documents, there's the, this idea of a right of self-determination of peoples uh, in several UN um, General Assembly resolutions and, and actually in some major human rights conventions. But it's a very ambiguous phrase, and the ambiguity has not been sorted out by a process of international law that's clarified what the right of self-determination is. The idea of a right of self-determination of peoples is easily confused with what political philosophers traditionally have called the normative nationalist principle. That's the principle that every nation or people has a right to its own state. Notice, not just a right to some kind of self-rule, some, say, intrastate autonomy regime within a sovereign state, but a right to its own state. If you think about it, that's a very uh, incendiary principle because depending on how you count peoples or nations, there might be as many as, say, 8,000 uh, on our planet. And the idea that each should somehow magically come to have its own state would require uh, either genocide on unprecedented uh, proportions or a change of heart in human beings of a sort that we've never witnessed before. Also, this phrase, the right of self-determination to peoples, encourages the idea that whoever has a right of self-determination has a right to secede. I think this is a big mistake. We have to distinguish between having a right of self-determination and having a right to secede because self-determination can come in varying forms and with varying degrees. <coughs> now, in international law, in practice, there's a kind of arbitrary <coughs> restriction of this idea of all people's right of self-determination to what's sometimes called saltwater decolonization. That is, it's not really treated in international law, in practice, as if it were a kind of sweeping right of self-determination for all peoples, at least where self-determination includes the right to opt for independent statehood. Instead, these documents in which the, the phrase, the right of self-determination peoples appeared, you have to see them in the context of the decolonization movements of the uh, 1960s through 70s. And in those contexts, there was a tacit restriction of the idea of the right of self-determination, at least so far as it includes the right to full independence, to what you might call classic cases of, of decolonization. But the problem is with this, this very broad phrasing in the documents and no um, coherent legal doctrine, just this sort of in-practice restriction to classic decolonization, the idea of, of people's right of self-determination doesn't provide guidance for more frequent cases of self-determination. That is, now that we're through the period of classic decolonization, when secessionist crises arise now, they're not the situation of some colony on another continent fighting a war of national liberation to come out from under colonial rule from some European power. Instead, the crises arise with embedded national minorities that is, within the boundaries of existing states. Also, there's a lack of any normatively coherent legal practice for the recognition of new states emerging through the process of secession. There was an attempt by something called the Badinter Commission to formulate guidelines for the recognition of new states emerging from the dissolution of, of Yugoslavia. And in principle, this sounded very good because there was the idea that for, say, Croatia or uh, Kosovo or um, um, Bosnia to be recognized as a new independent state, those states would have to issue some credible guarantees that they would protect the rights of the new minorities that were created by their seceding from uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, so the idea was that the time of recognizing or not recognizing a new state emerging through the process of secession was a kind of leverage point, a sort of normative leverage point. States, new states need to be recognized. They need to have all the privileges that go with recognition as a member of the state system. 
And the idea was that that was the point to apply some pressure and get some credible guarantees that the first act of independence wouldn't be to start persecuting minorities within your new boundaries. Um, the same people that, that, that you claim have been persecuting you and giving you the reason for seceding in the first place. But this didn't really work. Germany uh, first recognized Slovenia and, and Croatia. Then a number of other countries followed suit. And there really wasn't any kind of serious effort to require the new states emerging from the breakup of Yugoslavia to meet the standards of protecting uh, embedded minorities' rights. And if you read the, the Declaration of Independence of Croatia, in the, first, in the first couple of sentences, it says something like, Croatia is a state for the Croatian people. Now, if you're a Serb living in Croatia and you hear this, you, you reach for your AK-47. Now, here's a, a scenario which Professor Verity alluded to, but I, I think it might be worth making it a little more explicit. You have an embedded national minority within a sovereign state. And that minority is agitating for some degree of autonomy, some kind of self-rule, not full independence, but some sort of intrastate autonomy. The state reluctantly grants some form of autonomy to this group. Uh, and it usually does this kicking and screaming, but it does it. And then when the state decides that there may be a slip from autonomy toward secession, or simply when they think they've, the power distribution has shifted so that now they can successfully repress the minority, then the state revokes the autonomy agreement. The next step is that people who had considered themselves autonomous, that is, who were looking for some sort of limited self-rule within the state, now move to the radical position of wanting secession, wanting their own state. States typically react very violently against attempts to break them up. So the state comes down hard on the secessionist. This repression by the state creates more people shifting from being autonomous to secessionist. Armed conflict ensues with massive human rights violations. And this happens actually over and over again. These are only a few examples where this death spiral has occurred. And it's disturbing that the so-called international community sits back and watches this happen over and over again and doesn't try to act more proactively. Now, it's very difficult for, for the international community to do this because this is a community of states, and state sovereignty is uh, a kind of sacred dogma. So how would it, what would you think would be a reasonable effort to try to stop this death spiral or at least reduce the frequency of it occurring. Well, before we get into that, I want to make a couple of distinctions. I'm a philosopher, so you have to bear with me. We make our living by making distinctions. Um, I want to distinguish between a unilateral right to secede and a consensual right to secede. Norway seceded through a process of negotiation in 1905 from Sweden. And in 1997, there was a uh, reference ruling from the Canadian Supreme Court on possible secession of Quebec from Canada. And it outlined a process of constitutional amendment by which Quebec could peaceably secede from Canada. So there's a huge difference between a unilateral right to secede, that is the idea that some group within a state has the right on its own, without consensus, without negotiation, without any sort of constitutionally structured process, to become an independent state, versus saying that it has a right, but it's a right, uh, as the Canadian Supreme Court puts it, for a uh, good faith effort to negotiate a consensual secession. Now, there are two types of normative theories of the unilateral rights to secede. I mean, the unilateral right is, in a way, the most uh, urgent topic, right? Because that's what uh, efforts to exercise unilateral right is what results in bloodshed, typically. There are what I call remedial right-only theories. That is, they say that the unilateral right to secede is a remedial right. It's a right that you get when some other important rights have been violated. It's not a primary right. And different remedial right theories 
have different views about what the kinds of injustices are that would justify unilateral secession. It might be persistent violations of individual human rights. It might be violation of autonomy agreements. In fact, I think the strongest case that uh, Kosovar Albanians have for secession is that Milosevic tore up the autonomy agreement that they had with Serbia. Now, there are different accounts of how this occurred. The Serbs will tell you, or some Serbs will tell you, that the Albanians were abusing the autonomy agreement, that they were setting up a kind of mafia state under the pretext of a kind of intrastate autonomy, and that they were um, setting up a patronage system that excluded Serbs. They were actively, perhaps, persecuting Serbs. There are different views about what happens when autonomy agreements break down. And I think that's going to be important to keep in mind when you think about what role um, third parties might play. Now, the other kind of, of normative theory of the unilateral right to seed is sometimes called primary right or choice theories. And they can either be of the nationalist sort, that is, they, they follow this normative nationalist principle that I mentioned earlier and I said I thought was extremely uh, dangerous, in fact, mind-bogglingly dangerous. It's simply the idea that if you count as a nation, you're a group that counts as a nation, then it's your choice to become independent. That's all there is to it. It's a primary right. It's not a right that you only get when other rights are violated. Another version of the primary right or choice theory of unilateral secession is the plebiscitary view. And that is that the group doesn't have to count as a nation. It just has to be the case that a majority of people within some particular region in the state want to secede and that that's sufficient for them having a unilateral right. Now, for fairly obvious reasons, I think the remedial right-only theories are more attractive, more plausible, and also much more likely to uh, come some distance toward actually being recognized by the system of states than anything as radical as a primary right theory. Now, here's a suggestion, keeping these distinctions in mind, for how to avoid the death spiral, or at least to reduce uh, the incidence of the death spiral. And just for a, a, a tag for it, I call it the isolate and proliferate strategy. And it goes like this. The first step is to both conceptually and in practice uncouple secession from self-determination. Acknowledge that groups can have a right of self-determination without having a right to secede. This is important uh, with respect to something that Professor Verity said. He said that he, he thought that Milosevic believed that if the Albanians had autonomy, then there would be a kind of slippery slope towards secession. Given the ambiguity of the idea of a right of people to self-determination and the unclarity of international law on this topic, that's not an unrealistic fear. So something needs to be done to clearly separate these. Second step is to uncouple the right to secede from nationality. That is, first of all, to reject the claim that nations as such have the right to secede, the normative and nationalist principle. And second, to recognize that groups can sometimes have a right of self-determination whether or not they count as nations. In other words, I think it's a mistake to try to focus too much on the status question of whether a group counts as a nation or not, or a people. There's simply no likelihood of agreement on who gets that label. Instead, if you take the remedial view, then you focus on what sort of grievances a group has. That's what's really important, and whether they're having some sort of self-rule, some limited self-rule, intrastate autonomy, is likely to be an appropriate remedy for those abuses and prevention of further abuses. Third step is to isolate the unilateral right to secede as a remedial right only. That is, just hive it off from discussions of self-determination, if at all possible. Make sure people don't think there's a kind of general right of self-determination that includes the option of going for full independence. And think of secession as a very serious, exceptional situation that's only justified unilaterally in the case of some fairly uncontroversial large-scale injustices. Fourth step, proliferate interstate autonomy regimes as alternatives to secession. Professor Verry and I were talking, it turns out that we both uh, consulted with uh, the UN High Commission on National Minorities in the late 90s, um, uh, Max van der Stahl. And he was looking, when I talked to him, for lists, sort of menus of alternatives he could propose to 
leaders of embedded national minorities uh, in European states and to the leaders of those states for thinking how they could move away from the question secession or not to the question is there some meaningful form of intrastate autonomy that could be worked out for these groups. But I think it's important not just to leave it at the level of, say, the UN High Commission on National Minorities whispering in the ear of diplomats. There needs to be some kind of more robust international or regional support for interstate autonomy arrangements as alternatives to secession. That means there needs to be support in the negotiating of such agreements, interstate autonomy agreements, and support for ensuring compliance. Because there's a serious assurance problem here, right? On the one hand, the autonomists are worried that they'll make some concession that they won't go for complete independence and instead opt for autonomy, but the state will, at its own whim, revoke the autonomy agreement. On the other hand, the state leaders are worried that if they agree to autonomy, it'll be the beginning of a slippery slope toward secession. So both parties need assurance, and I think by the nature of the case, they're not likely to be able to give each other assurance without third party help. So that's basically the point that I just made, that this kind of strategy, this international support for negotiating and ensuring compliance with interstate autonomy regimes could help avoid the death spiral by providing assurance to states that in granting interstate autonomy they don't thereby implicitly recognize a right to full independence, providing assurance to minorities that if they opt for interstate autonomy, the state won't renege. So that's basically um, all I have to say with one exception. I think it's interesting if you look at the scholarly literature and to some extent the public debate in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, you see a kind of progression. First, at the time that the major secessions from the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia were occurring, there's a huge literature on secession, the legality of it, the morality of it, the politics of it. Then in 1999, with the NATO intervention in Kosovo, you get a huge burgeoning of literature on the law, politics, and morality of humanitarian armed intervention. Then, with the invasion of Iraq in, in uh, March of 2003, we just passed the fifth anniversary, you get a huge shift in the literature toward the war on terror and forcible democratization. The problem is that all of these things are linked, right? I mean, the intervention, the NATO intervention in um, Kosovo in 1999 occurred because there wasn't some serious effort earlier on to deal with the problems arising from the breakup of Yugoslavia. Now, uh, in President Bush's war on terror, you have a tendency for the U.S. government to support state leaders in the name of fighting the war against terrorism when those leaders are suppressing self-determination movements of national minorities within their own states. And it's, it's predictable that this should happen if there's not any sort of clear, coherent idea about how the United States and other states, individually and in organizations, should respond to secessionist or self-determination crises. Thank you. Because others always fear if panelists agree that that would be a bad thing, need be a bad thing, but it might also be a consequence just of um, caution from everyone with very subtle topics. I'll Try to ask Chris, Professor Varad, if he finds anything where he disagrees with. Or Professor, um, you can just. Well, outside disagreement, actually, I, I, I couldn't find any, any point. Um, maybe I would uh, add one thing, which is uh, uh, the Baden Ter Commission was mentioned. And maybe I would just add that uh, the constitution of the former Yugoslavia had some unclear formulations which did not exclude, at least arguably, mm -hmm. secession That's right. of the republics, but not of Kosovo, because Kosovo was not a republic. Right. So what was plausible for Slovenia, Croatia, under the Yugoslav constitution was at least legally impossible for Kosovo. And maybe another point, uh, again, not refuting anything what was said, uh, 
in this very short time period when uh, Milan Panic, an American millionaire, uh, became prime minister and the real power belonged to Milosevic, then uh, Panic challenged Milosevic because that was the only way to, uh, to have some real power and to really do something. And uh, these were presidential elections in December 1992. And on these elections, Spanish did well enough to surprise anyone, but not well enough to win. Uh, Milosevic won by a margin of 6 or 7 percent. Now, what's interesting here is that the Albanian vote could have amounted to about 20 percent. So there was a very strong and they were to try to make the Albanians vote. And I had some little role in it, but a major player was the German ambassador to Serbia and Cyrus Vance, the former uh, state secretary of the United States. And the Albanian response was the following, not officially, but rather clearly, that we have suffered so much uh, that <coughs> We know that under Panic we would get back autonomy, that it would be better, but it's enough. We want uh, Milosevic to prevail, although we, we hate him, because this might bring about uh, an explosion of the whole country. So uh, I was uh, really shocked by this. Uh, the Albanian suffering was uh, true suffering, but it seems that at that time, at that time, the Albanian vote could have uh, turned the tables and turned the situation because uh, 6 or 7% was missing and they had in a control of 20% of the vote. But they boycotted the vote. If, if I, may, I think that's a really interesting point and it raises a question which I think um, nobody who's tried to work out theories of the unilateral right to secede has answered and that is, it, it's one thing to say, well, um, unilateral secession could be justified if there are some uh, persisting injustices. But the question is, at what point, if there's a change of regime, and it looks like it's going to be more hopeful, yeah. uh, at what point do the people who've been suffering these persecutions in the past still have the right to say, well, we've had enough, mm -hmm. and we're not going to meet you halfway, we're not going to, to uh, give you some uh, credibility and give you a chance to do better. Uh, now, and I think it's, it's tricky because if you look at the history of these uh, breakdowns of autonomy agreements, there are some cases where um, the state over and over betrays the autonomy agreement. Chechnya is a good example. I mean, and going, going back, uh, you know, for uh, over a century. But I, I just don't know the answer to that question. I mean, you know, should, should the Albanians have said, well, now we have a new government and... Uh, we should get on board, give them the benefit of a doubt, and what, start dismantling our parallel state? Well, building up the parallel state was very difficult. And they would need that parallel state if things break down, if they revert to the former kind of situation of persecution. So I think without really strong, credible assurances backed up by third parties, it may have been more, more forgivable, more reasonable for the Albanians to do what they did. Yeah. But that means there was a missed opportunity on the part of, of, of the international community for trying to provide the kind of assurance that might, would have made it more reasonable for Albanians to, to try to, to make it within Serbia in an, in an intrastate autonomy agreement. So at this point under your theory, and <coughs> does Kosovo has a right, have a right to secede or not? I think so, um, but you know, saying it's a saying it's a theory is a little uh, a little ambitious. It makes it sound like it's this elaborate, well worked out, uh, rational system. It's a kind of an approach, and I guess you know, if forced, and I was afraid that you were going to force me to make a judgment on this, I guess I would say that that given the history of of the treatment of the Albanians by the Serbs, and given the lack of really clear international commitment to um, supporting them from now on. I don't think it's 
unjustified for the, for the Kosovar Albanians to assert their independence. But I think it could have been done in a, I agree completely with Professor Vary, it would have been better to do it in the, in the heat of the war when Milosevic was already, people were already defecting from Milosevic anyway. Um, and it, it might have been much easier to justify then. Then when you, when you have Milosevic out, you have a new government, the new government's doing a lot better in some respects. Um, I think then we'll get questions from the, sorry, about that. Um, I had a question about Macedonia. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, this, uh, the Kosovo Declaration clearly is giving some impetus to uh, the Albanians in Macedonia, and I was wondering, what are kind of the actions that both the international community, you know, and countries in the region and Macedonia can take to sort of, I don't know, <laughs> not necessarily, you know, appease the situation, but, you know, create an agreement, an interstate agreement that would actually work, or I don't know if they want to allow the Albanians, the Macedonians to see, you know, do that <coughs> in some sort of peaceful manner. I'm just wondering, what are kind of the conditions that, what are kind of the things that need to take place right now? Well, here we are coming to this uh, sacred sentence, no precedent. Uh, but uh, yes, the Albanians in Macedonia are watching this very, very closely. And yes, I hear that there are um, voices that this should be followed, just like in uh, former Soviet Republic in Georgia, just like in Spain, just like in many countries. So I think it would. Uh, whether this crisis will be somehow uh, manageable or not, but it will yield a temptation and a danger for Macedonia, I believe. Now, whether this danger will be, you know, handled, uh, unlike Kosovo, uh, the secession of Macedonia, Albanians would obviously not have this international support. Uh, but. Uh, Kosovo has to a very large extent. So uh, the Kosovo Albanians have uh, much less chance, but I think some tensions will arise, yes. I have a question about, about uh, what took place after Milosevic was settled, and so during uh, the time when uh, the Serbian State was and still is uh, democratic uh, because there is if there is one of the justifications of minority rights is to, <coughs> to generate loyalty which means that if people feel they are recognized and it is not the state of the ethnic majority then they will be more loyal to the state of course there is another slippery slope and there were a lot of debates about the 1919 system of the League of Nations does it generate loyalty or, or secession but then it's, it's, it uh, can be tried. And my question is, is a double question. The government, when, when Milosevic uh, uh, was uh, toppled, the, the democratic government knew uh, Koshunica or Tadic, they knew the situation in Kosovo. Uh, what did they do in order to create, uh, did they take some measures of confidence in order to, to prevent uh, secession, saying, well, we want to give autonomy, but, but more than that, uh, measures of confidence. And on the other side, were measures of confidence taken by the majority, uh, the Albanian majority, in independent Kosovo, towards Serbs uh, in Mitrovica and elsewhere, in order to prevent what is taking place today? Serious. Yeah. Well, uh, the Serbian government didn't do anything. But this time, I am not blaming them. I'm not blaming them because they had no power to do anything. Uh, Kosovo has become, in 99 a protectorate in which Serbia had zero uh, de facto power. They could make a that was probably done, but that was really. So uh, everybody was waiting uh, for something to happen. Uh, because uh, there was zero possibility for any Serbian authority. There were no Serbian laws applied, no Serbian court system, no administration, no police. Uh, so it was uh, 
independent, but not in the hands of the Albanians, but in the hands of the United Nations um, uh, authorities. But, but now, from the Albanian side, two years ago, there was a wave of violence against uh, Serbian uh, churches and Serbs, and this was strongly condemned by the United Nations and by the European Union. Uh, after that, uh, the Albanian uh, reaction was checked. But since then, of course, the Serbs, without in being 10% and without uh, really strong protection, it was more a Serbian tragedy than an Albanian during the past years. I think it would have been very uh, politically difficult, if not political suicide, for one of the first acts of the new Serbian government to be to take a very conciliatory uh, stance toward the Kosovar Albanians and propose on its own some strengthened autonomy agreement with assurances. The question, I think, is whether, uh, whether the Serbian government could have been prompted to do that by some combination of carrots and sticks coming from third parties. And that, I just don't know what the answer to that is, but it, it seems to me that it, it, you're right. It's not, they, they couldn't really say, well, we're going to do this now because they had no authority. Right. But they could have perhaps made a proposal, and, and if they'd had support from others, made a proposal for a point in the future when the, uh, uh, the external administration, uh, the, the, the NATO administration was pulling out, that they would issue you know, credible assurances that this is the kind of autonomy arrangement which we will uh, recognize and um, you know, here are the third parties that will back it up. Here will be the consequences of our defaulting. Here would be the consequences of your defaulting. N none of that was done. Um, uh, I guess I don't so much blame the Serbian government for not doing it as I blame third parties for not encouraging them to doing it or making a proposal of some kind. Uh, but again, the pattern has been a reluctance to interfere in, quote, internal matters like this and wait until they get to the stage of a genocide or uh, massive refugee flows, something disastrous that can't be ignored. And then the, the, uh, the options for intervention are really limited at that point. So I think a proactive response would be worth trying. Maybe we can pool your question, your question, then have a collective response and see if that works enough. All right, um, I guess I have a couple of comments and a question. Um, you mentioned that the first um, country to recognize Kosovo was Afghanistan, and I was wondering, um, uh, and so I was wondering um, what um, role Islam plays in this, and how is Islam being um, highlighted in the media um, or by um, the state um, to frame uh, Kosovo independence, um, or is it even a factor? I guess my second question is um, self-determination versus um, succession. You mentioned the saltwater decolonization, and you mentioned um, the League of Nations. And um, so this draws in the um, idea of, uh, it, historically, this draws in the idea of mandate. And so I guess my question is, um, with regards to the state of Israel, does this fit into the primary right theory or the um, remedial right theory, or is it um, a special case? Um, my third comment, I guess, is um, when you were mentioning, um, you were mentioning, um, I guess, different states that are um, involved in successionist, that have successionist movements right now, um, I didn't get to write down your complete list, but um, you had um, Sudan, Kashmir, and Chechnya, and um, like I guess the states in which these um, movements are occurring all say that these movements are financed by outside powers. You know, I mean, India says that Pakistan is financing Kashmir. So the Sudani government says Israel is financing the Southern Movement, and um, Czech, um, a whole different group of um, international terrorists have been um, posited as um, having a role in the Chechnya secessionist movement. So my question is um, how does outside funding play in international validation of a successionist movement, whether this be overt or covert funding? Like um, if, uh, say, um, uh, uh, an entrenched form of colonialist power is back in a successionist movement, how does this play out in an international court where this country may have, an, um, may have a larger voice than, say, um, say um, uh, the minority which is calling for the successionist movement? Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. First of all, uh, because I'm in Serbia, so I'm really interested in this topic. And uh, there was a question: Did Serbia offer anything to Kosovo Albanians? And I would like to say that uh, the Serbian government did offer, 
uh, but it was too late because the negotiations began two years ago between the Albanian side and the Serbian side, and uh, Serbia was offering uh, anything, everything but independence. So uh, for Serbia, it would have been enough just to have uh, on the map Kosovo and Serbia, but the West rejected that. And under the table, Serbia was even offering division of Kosovo so that the northern part would uh, become part of Serbia and yet the rest would be independent. But uh, still, the West said, uh, no, Kosovo will be independent uh, in its entire borders. And I would just like to emphasize that uh, this date is kind of symbolic. Today is 24th of March. And <coughs> on the 24th of March, 1999, uh, NATO intervention against Serbia started. And if you go back to 1999, and if you hear the statements by the President Bill Clinton or Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, or Javier Solana who was then General Secretary of NATO, Secretary General of NATO, you will see that they were all stressing out that this is not uh, an intervention against the Serbian people, and that this is not an intervention to take away territory from Serbia, but that this it is an intervention to prevent Milosevic's forces against crackdown on Kosovo Albanians. But now it's 2008. Milosevic uh, is dead. Uh, democratic government is in Belgrade, but still uh, the West decided that Kosovo should be independent. So my question to Professor Buchanan would be: Does he uh, says does he say that uh, in, uh, humanitarian intervention uh, is uh, a way to grant people people's uh, right to self determination? So does international community have a right to? Uh, come with, with army to independent states and to uh, grant the right of self-determination to, to people. Yeah, I guess that makes four questions. I wish we could spend four hours to say really good questions. <laughs> great, and great all that question. we have is, um, I would say, five minutes at most. So um, can, I'll ask both of you. Can I just make a quick reply to the last point that the gentleman from Serbia made? And then, yes, you, you, and then I'll, you, I, you, I think. You can gladly start. Uh, and, yeah. yeah um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to endorse something as open-ended as a right of armed intervention to support secessionist movements. Um, I don't think we've got the, the right kind of international institutions for making that decision. I don't think the Security Council is up to that kind of decision. Um, and so even though you know I could maybe imagine a uh, uh, a better institutional arrangement in which it might be sometimes justified for uh, multilateral forces to intervene on behalf of uh, secessionists who had genuine grievances and who had tried autonomy agreements and the state had been completely unresponsive and replied you know, brutally. I can imagine a situation in which that could be justified, but that's quite different from saying that I think you know, it, there's a defensible right um, of the international community to do that um, in the absence of the kind of uh, institutions that would be needed to prevent the invocation of that right being simply a pretext for uh, you know, geopolitical ambitions on the part of uh, powerful states, um, selective application, arbitrary application of the right. But that's what's exactly what's happening. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think the decision making for the intervention in and Kosovo 1999 was, uh, was the right sort of decision-making process. Okay, I, I, will, I would like one part of your question, the one uh, regarding other examples, Israel, Chechnya, the Middle East, leave it to you if you want I was to. hoping that nobody was going to bring up Israel. Because, I was just uh, praying that this wouldn't uh, come but up. It's, but let me start with Afghanistan, uh, so I don't want completely to dodge you. I don't think it's Islam which, what uh, spurred Afghanistan towards this step. Uh, the Islamic countries have been much more reluctant than expected. Uh, so it is not an Islamic. Uh, so far, only about 30 something countries have recognized out of 190 members of the United Nations. I teach Hun I don't know. 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 190. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's, and very few Islamic countries. So I, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that Afghanistan doesn't really have a completely independent foreign policy nowadays. Uh, so I don't think it was an Afghan um, um, motivation. Now, uh, secession determination, just one uh, 
footnote, during the Yugoslav crisis, one very interesting point arose that, okay, you have self-determination. Everybody was uh, completely for self-determination. But, you know, you have a precondition on what territory. The <coughs> Croats uh, wanted self-determination in Croatia. The Serbs in Croatia wanted self-determination on those territories in which they lived. If you have self-determination vote in Serbia, then Kosovo will remain part of Serbia. If you have in Kosovo, it will be independent. If you take the Serbian part of Kosovo, uh, where you still have a Serbian majority, then that would join Serbia. So for self-determination, you would need in advance some criterion to decide on what territory will you have it, and that may be damn difficult to, uh, to decide. And um, about the negotiations, I, I think it's, it's right that uh, both uh, all big powers, United States, European included, European Union included, made it almost clear and almost explicit that if no deal is struck, independence will be recognized. So this was certainly not uh, prompting uh, parties, particularly not the Kosovo party, to, to negotiate. If they know if we fail, we win. So that's really not, so you are absolutely right on that point. Okay, so we, so we end yeah. with some agreement then. Um, we've run over time, but I think this raises many more questions that we don't have time to answer today. But I've become very educated by this. I know a lot more. I have a better view of it. I hope that's true for all of you. Thanks very much. Professor Buchanan.